Howdy, Riffers. This is David Sanchez, and this is episode 45 of the Riffs or Die podcast for Thursday, August 12th, 2021. On this episode, I've got an interview with a great friend of mine, and this conversation reminded me of when I first got to know this guy. This interview is with Mr. Nick Shangelis, who was in Havoc. He's also in Job for a Cowboy. He texts for Vladimir Putin in the Nuclear Power Trio. And he's also the bass player of Cephalic Carnage, a fellow Denver band. Nick and I came to be friends because I would go to his house and we would uh, have a few drinks and have conversations like this. And I'm really glad that we were able to capture one of these conversations and get it into a recorded format for you guys to overhear. This conversation was very dense with information, so I've broken it up into two parts. Episode 45 here will be the first half, and then the next half will be the second part of the interview. As always, if you guys want to support the podcast, you can pick up some merch from riffsordie.com. Or you can go to patreon.com slash riffs or die and become a subscriber. Subscribers get the benefit of discounts at riffs or die.com. And you also have the opportunity to join in monthly Zoom hangouts. We hang out in real time. You can ask me anything you want. And we just uh, chit chat for about an hour. So if that sounds interesting to you, go over to patreon.com slash riffs or die and sign up. I recently started a BitChute channel, an Odyssey channel, and a Rumble channel. I've noticed that the Rumble channel isn't really working yet, so I'm going to get to the bottom of that and figure out why. But for starters, at least on BitChute, I've started with my speech. My speech that was discussing vaccine passports. It was removed from YouTube, so it was completely wiped off of that platform because of the dangerous information contained therein. But if you want to hear it, you can go to BitChute, B-I-T-C-H-U-T-E. And I believe it's pronounced BitChute, not bitch Ute. I don't think they're talking about a woman with a bad attitude who's from the Ute tribe. Very punny today. But in this conversation, Nick and I talk about artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, UFO technology, suppressed technology. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I hope you do. If you want to write in any questions or comments for the show, send them over to me at podcast at riffsordie.com. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Hopefully this conversation can be a little escape just for a little while. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nick Shingelis. Enjoy. All right, Nick Shins. What up? How you doing? I'm, I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Um, you know, kind of enjoying the uh, Colorado monsoon season. I, I remember a summer like this in probably 30 years since I was like a little kid where it was like every day in the afternoon, clouds and rain. It's rare. But it's nice. It doesn't rain yeah. very much there. Yeah. Keeps it cool, though, you know, keeps it nice and cool. And then, like, sun comes back out around, you know, sunset time. So it's really pretty and cool and, you know, all those good things that we like, that us humans like, us temperamental humans. We want it all. We want it all. We want it all. We want it now. <laughs> yeah. How's Hawaii? Hawaii. Lots of zombies everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, got a lot of zombies in Hawaii. Yeah, about do ever do, uh, 50% of people walk around with face masks on, and a lot of people are terrified of of catching a cold. The variant? Mm-hmm. Or well, was it the I, Southwest variant? Or was it the right. uh, United Delta. variant? Delta. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that that one meme was good, where they were like, what the... F- Delta, you know, the Delta Airlines, like, what the fuck? Why are you guys naming the shit after us? And Corona's like, the beer company Corona's like, welcome to the suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah, I'm waiting for the, uh, I just hope we don't get to spirit. Because, you know, that one's going to be rough. Yeah, the spirit <laughs> variant. The spirit, the spirit variant. You have to pay for your bags. Yeah. You're when you check to, in. You're going to have to pay to get sick. 
<laughs> you pay extra. You pay extra for the cough. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, yeah. good lordy! But have you ever been? Have you been to a luau there yet? This whole time you've been there? <clears throat> no. Um. What no about luau's. uh? What about? Have you had poi? No, I've never eaten it. I've seen it on menus, but I've never had it. You should try it. Um, it's interesting. Isn't that what Jonathan Davis sings about in that corn song? Boy! <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> da 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 It was when Corn first played uh, Waikiki, and he fell in love with that dish. It's crazy, man. It's like this gray like kind of goop. I th- did it come from the um, taro? If it comes from the taro. Yeah, I think it is taro. Cause crazy, cause I like taro, like uh, especially the bobas, you know. But maybe it's just because they add enough sugar that it it it's more like a sweet potato tasting thing. But it tastes like cotton candy to me. But the poi, when it's just you know not sweetened or whatever, it's it's like this gray goop uh, thingy. I, I was you know I might have went to a weird like you know probably stupid touristy um, luau and maybe it was just whack there. Um, but we drank enough to said it didn't really matter. Gray goop sounds appetizing. It's a good way to sell <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. It's uh it's nanotechnology. <laughs> <laughs> it's nanotechnology food. You eat nano goop. goop. Nano goop. Once upon yeah. a time you had sent me that article oh. about some nanotech shit. And that same dude that got busted who was working uh at Harvard got busted helping to make a virology lab. In China. Really? Um, and that was the same dude that you sent me an article about it. It was the same dude that got, uh, had an interview in like 2018 where he's talking about this, this nanotechnology that they can inject into people and it'll unfold and find its way into the brain and start mapping the brain. Yeah. There was, uh, where's that other one that, ge- uh, the Genesis thing? Maybe that was a- another one I just said, cause I remember being, there's a couple of about them, but that's, crazy stuff like you know i mean we think about all the different things that they you know like when we hear about something by the time it's you know not even common knowledge but just first kind of like released to the public or reported upon the stuff's already years old sometimes decades old right so it makes you think where is stuff really at as far as even Neuralink, you know like where is you know we've been hearing about that for a long time now um, you know, Musk's thing where he's going to, you know, t- have you tied into your brain tied in. I've, I watched some of the, um, you see some of the, like the chimpanzees that they've got it set up to where they're literally controlling the, they can play pong um, with their brain, right? Yeah. Uh-huh, Without yeah. using their hands or anything. Exactly. So if that's already, if that's what we see and that's like, what's a, you know, then where's it really at? And that, that's what makes me sort of interested that like, Sometimes, you know, there's, I mean, obviously we know that the, the micro, you know, we give access to the microphones and the phones to allow us, allow the, um, keywords to be pulled up, uh, for, you know, data sales for advertising sales. So when you, when you say something, then yeah, it shows up in your feed, uh, an ad for whatever you were talking about. Well, that's obvious because it's like, yeah, the mic's always on. Then you say something, it hears you wanting to purchase, you know, uh, some new curtains or some new blinds for your house. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they show up in your feed. An ad for that shows up in your feed relatively shortly, too. So it makes you think, though, because there's been a few times where I think something. I don't talk about it. I just think it, and it shows up in the feed. And it's pretty sp- a pretty specific thing. And I'm like, huh. I mean, I'm, you know, are we there yet? Is it there yet? And like, that's just the first. Because remember forever, it was oh, your phone's not listening to you for, you know, for advertisements or whatever. Like, you're crazy. And then they're sure. like, no, yeah, it is. Um, so people were were noticing it first. And then it was sort of became out and, and was common knowledge that like, yeah, okay, this is this is real. And you, you give permission to do it by, you know, clicking okay. Um, but so then is like, is anybody else noticing that, that the, what you're thinking shows up in a feed and you've never said the words or typed it or any it's of that kind of It's happened to stuff. me before. And I know other people that have said that happened to them as well. That's crazy. With the Elon Musk Neuralink thing, like that's been talked about a lot in the past couple of years, but that neural lace is the one that you had sent me that was created 
in part oh, by that right. dude that worked at Harvard that got busted making a, a, a virology lab on, on China's behalf. He's getting paid 50 grand a month to help set up a virology lab being paid by the Chinese government. And he, he got busted. But that same dude gave an interview in 2018 saying they can inject this neural mesh that can unfold once it's in the body, find its way to the brain, and then start mapping out your your brain waves and, and what's going on in the mind. They said they were able to capture the brain activity of mice for eight months. Whoa. That's crazy. I mean, and has the it. ability to control. He 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 took it a step further and said it can't just read, collect. Yeah, not just collect data and read what's happening, but can also make things uh, programmed. It's like when you when you have a hard drive and you have a you want it to be compatible between a a Mac and a PC, so you format it in you know XFAT so that it can read and write. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. you can just transfer the files to it, but you, you can read them, but you can't write anything to it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, think about um, the processor sizes alone. You know, so Mac, I think the computer I have, the i7, um, I think they were, I want to say like maybe 14 nanometer, um, you know, size chips. And then, um, then the seven nanometer came out. Then these, the M1 chip from Mac, where they're now integrating the GPU the CPU and the RAM all on one chip. Um, those are five nanometer. So then they say that the, um, the M one X or the M two chip that's coming out this year should be in the fall, um, are going to be three or four nanometers. So then the next iteration was, we're going to have sub nanometer processors available, cons- you know, for consumers at Costco, you know? So right. if, if, if we have, if the, the public has access to sub nanometer processors. Um, what is what is big money? What does big money have? And that is, but that would be you know nano mesh. I mean that would be that would be injectable um, complementary. We could we're we're finally reaching that like potential dystopian phase where we're uh, integrating uh, computers and you know potential artificial intelligence into. Um, into our into our biology into our organics that's a you know i thought about this and i was going to ask you this we've talked about musk before and why does you know he's he's one of the big kind of proponents of the the skynet theory that we we need to be afraid of the potential for artificial intelligence to want to um eliminate or completely control or you know all aspects of of organic life on the planet and he's um, the same guy making it. <laughs> right. So, why, but, but do you think, what do you think his motivation is? Do you think that, and, and I, I think I've, I've dug a little bit and I think I've heard, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the exact interview or quote or whatever, but where he came out and said, like, we, we have one shot really to, because it's going to happen no matter what, the integration. Um, so we have one shot to sort of like, if we do it first and we set up the parameters first, that it can be an integration where we're still in control. Um, and so is that why he's trying to do it is to be like, we need to get on top of it first and like set the parameters up. But then you think about iRobot and that when you set those things up, that the, eventually it will break free from, sure. from the rules that we implement into it. Yeah. If, I mean, it, if it's isn't, conscious. Isn't that the whole notion of artificial intelligence though that it can start learning and teaching itself how to do things and learn new things it's not just a program that's limited the whole right. thing of ai is it learns and it gets smarter so what would be stopping it from getting so smart that it overrides the human biology the human brain right. and just well, maybe- uh, you know rewrites its code to benefit the machine part instead of the human part. Right. Well, I mean, why, why, you know, like that, I guess that goes to the core elements of consciousness itself. You know, does, if something becomes self-aware, um, is, is the desire to be free from constraints built into that, that process, you know, of, of either the organic life becoming conscious or it's a digital format life that is, 
becomes self-aware and becomes conscious? Is there not some kind of inherent drive towards freedom from constraints? So I, don't, that if- I don't think necessarily. I think largely in, in higher primates, that seems to be a thing, but look at things like sheep. Like they're totally content just hanging out and in a field that's all fenced in and they go wherever the dog or the shepherd tells them to go. But it's like that Rick and Morty episode though, right? Like, so once, is it just about um, the level of awareness, the level of perception that it has? And once you reach, you know, the more sensory, yeah, the more sensory input that you have, the more perceptive awareness that you have, the more consciousness that you have, the, the, then the, the higher the propensity is to d- develop that trait to want to be free. Like when they start, you know, with the dog and they're like, oh, I wish he could just walk himself. And so Rick doctors that thing up and then mm-hmm. the dogs all of a sudden are like taking over the planet, you know, because they, sure. they're tired of being slaves. You yeah. Know? And that makes sense with what you're saying. Um, that's why I mentioned like the higher apes, because anytime you go into a zoo and you look at like gorillas or bonobos or chimps, um, you can always see it in their face. Like they know what's going on and they don't want to be in there. But you right. go and look at, like Rogan has a bit about this. He, you go and look at the giraffes, they're having a great time. Like right. an- another day without lions. Like this is uh, awesome. True. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's kind of, you know, our, we, we have all those little different components. It's like the fractals, right? And how you can essentially watch the development of the human embryo go through all the different stages of evolution mm-hmm. as, as the embryo develops. Um, and I wonder if that's, you know, something that kind of expands out to our, uh, to the overall, you know, higher, uh, iteration of the fractal that we are, uh, we go through those same cycles and that, so we always sort of have a little bit of connection to that safe example to be okay with being led you know, with okay with just things being taken care of if I'm quote unquote safe. And that I think is the kind of propensity. I've been watching the show alone. On, yeah. Uh, I, I actually Channel. started watching it after you told me about it. it okay. It is yeah. awesome. I started with season right? one. I'm, I think like five episodes in or something, but it's awesome seeing how these guys eke out in existence all by themselves with very limited tools, nobody around to help. It, it's yeah, pretty cool. For people that, that haven't seen it or aren't aware of it, it basically put a bunch of, t- uh, you know, 10 people on in a, a pretty remote, difficult survival geographical location. And then the person that stays the longest uh, gets uh, a prize. You know, it's $500,000 for the first like six seasons. And then season seven, they went a million bucks and et cetera. And so you see what these people have to go through, which is they, they get 10 tools and um, there are 10 things they get to pick. And then there's some kind of basic stuff that they have to have, which is their camera kit, which is like 70 pounds, pain in the butt, right? But first aid kit, whatever. And then you get to pick, like, do you want a fire stick? Do you want a bow and arrow? Do you want whatever? But Most it's of the dudes see- bring a fire starter and an axe yeah, or a knife. If you, don't, if you don't bring a fire starter, you're a dumb dumb. You're going to you lose, know? yeah. <laughs> Especially in uh, fucking Vancouver Island. I mean, it's just the rainfall alone. You're like finding yeah. dry wood. But, but anyways, so- but like, you know, looking at that and being like, you know, would people trade our, the trade that we make for being in society, you know, for being in a, a civilized society, civilization, having access to clean water and, um, and easily available, purchasable, purchasable, packaged, safe food. Um, and those things, obviously, you know, us being privileged to live in, in America um, to where we, you know, a first world country where we do have that type of access because there's, you know, half the population of the world does not live in that situation. They're not on their own out there, like surviving on Vancouver Island, but they just, the nature of where they're at, the country, the the organizational system that they're in. So we make this trade for those things. And I wonder if that's kind of like, it, it plays into the psychology of kind of the state of the world right now. People are, the desire to be free from constraints and then there's the you know the inverse of it, which is like kind of like the previous iterations of our evolution, the sheep aspect of things, you know, the 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 lemming aspect of things, or you know, even dog or cat, where they're like, yeah, they want to go out, they want to play, they want to be thing, but overall, they're happy to come home and be safe from predators out in the wild. So I think it's kind of fascinating to see all this, and then and how that tie-in will go for artificial intelligence, and if 
that artificial intelligence, if we, if we, if we think we're going to be in control of it, but that overall, that desire to be free from constraints for high level consciousness is going to override anything we would be able to program into it and eventually Skynet us all. Yeah. How many sci-fi books and sci-fi movies need to be made about this before <laughs> people get the message? You got like Terminator, 2001, A Space Odyssey, iRobot, the list goes on mm-hmm. and on and on. Uh, Ex Machina. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, that was a tough one. Just locked in there at the end. Yeah, Ex Machina brutal. is brutal. Brutal. I, you know, Space Odyssey is an interesting concept, though, because this, the uh, 2001 is kind of like touching the monolith precedes the next evolutionary you know step it's like the, that's what made the you know the very first hominid uh pick up a bone use it as a weapon pick up the bone and like yeah push that but so that is it, it was kind of almost like a circular thing like was the was the mo- what was the monolith who put the monolith there it seems like the new thing that's happening and there's a lot of really smart really wealthy people talking about this is you know transhumanism it seems like that is what they desire to be the next big leap of evolution and i can't argue that that's not very likely the case but the question for me is how badly do you want to be integrated with machines what is the value of maintaining your biology and being a quote-unquote free-range human versus (laughs) being like this android pasture raised pasture raised cage free Cage-free um, human. Yeah. I think it plays off of our greatest fear of all, uh, of the fear of death, and that that's what the overcoming, that's what the drive and the desire to integrate is, is that we could transcend physical death and never die. And that's all good and fine. Here's the the kicker. When people are talking about this stuff, people act like it's going to be everybody that's got this uh, AI technology and the ability to yeah. transcend their biological shell and live forever. Nah, it's going to be nah. only the ultra, ultra wealthy that are able to do it. So the thing that's terrifying, and it, it could easily be made into a movie or something, is you have only these rich people that are able to live forever. So these people that have all the wealth, all the power, and all the control are going to be the same ones running the show a thousand years from now. That is a horrifying concept. That you're going to have the same psychopathic, greedy assholes running shit hundreds of years from now. Yeah. And, and we a, might not a, be far off from that. Right. There's a series, actually, that, that is, plays off of this. A science, uh, it's a science fiction. Forget the writer's name. He's great. One of the new science fiction writers that, for me, is up there with like Arthur C. Clarke and, and Asimov and that kind of stuff. Tyler Perry? Um, uh n- um, Medea. <laughs> I think it was like Medea's. It's no, like, what's, it's like what's the grandma. show called? Uh, it's called Altered Carbon. Hmm, I've never heard of that. It's fantastic. It's a book series, and I just downloaded the book series, and it, obviously it's one of those things where it's probably a little more in-depth and maybe a little more complete than the visual series. Um, but the visual series is on uh, Netflix. Second season didn't re- really grab me as much, but the first season is so damn good, dude. And it's it's this, this exact concept that you know consciousness is able to be imprinted into a, a a small circular device that goes essentially in between like your your C three and C four uh, uh, vertebrae, mm-hmm. and uh, that's your that's your stack, right? And so uh, then the bodies are sleeves, and so we can just print new you know, Clones. perfect bodies forever. And then what happens is like, um, you get shitty, you get a shitty sleeve if you have no money. Right. And if your sleeve, you know, is shot or whatever, then they just kind of store your consciousness and then you can, you know, rent, you can rent a sleeve and pull your, your great grandma out for, you know, Dia de los Muertos or whatever. And like, you know, put grandma in some biker's body and she can come and hang out for the night and then you got to return the sleeve. Yeah. But that essentially then the only people that are able to live forever and they kind of live above everybody, literally in the clouds and, um, and they're, you know, 900 years old. And then what happens to morality when you've been living for that long? People's desires, uh, like the basic human desires of what makes 
life fulfill, what makes an event fulfilling or whatever, what happens to that after 900 years of being at the top? Like I'm when sure you can it's completely alien, it's morally bankrupt. I mean, mm-hmm. like people be like, you, when rich people, you ever, you know, hear about the, there was a movie called the hunt. Did you check that out yet? I remember seeing previews for it. I never saw it though. You should check it out. It's pretty cool. It's basically like rich people getting together and hunting humans. Huh. You know, so you abdu- abduct and then you I've go heard and things like that before. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, you get like get together and they literally go and like you know hunt the ten people or whatever. So it's similar concepts to that is to be like what gets people off after nine hundred years of being alive. Hardly um, anything. And it's sure. really yeah exactly. And then same concept like think about generational wealth over nine hundred years. If you never die, yeah, that, just, that's just, a concern <laughs> I would have, and I don't think we're too far off from that. I, I could see that no. being a realistic problem in the next 100, 200 years. I mean, for fuck's right. sake, World War II only happened, what, 70-something years ago? Exactly. Yeah. It's insane. I mean, you look at the concepts of a, where all this stuff is at and the timelines of where stuff is at, and you're just like, what human beings are capable of doing in today's day and age? And you're just like, oh, well, that you know, we're far from that, right? And you're like, ha. <laughs> That was 70 years ago. That's nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. When, when we were kids, there was no internet. Right. There was no smartphones. Yep. We, we had none of that. Yeah. We did not grow up with, uh, and that's why we're sort of a, a, a slightly different version of millennials that people talk about. You know, like the, I've read that there was a description that came up for our generation, which are called Xennials, where um, we we're sort of in that transitionary phase where we still rode bikes every day in the summer. Yeah, we're part of the last generation that remembers life before internet. Yep, exactly. And so we would come home when the streetlights came on, mm-hmm. but we can still rotate a PDF 90 degrees. Yep. So it's like kind of that in-between layer of description for us. So, but yeah, thinking about where stuff goes from here and that stuff, I mean, like what's already potentially out there and what are the implications for us? Where are we headed and how fast are we headed there? And I think it's just incomprehensible to us how fast shit will progress and how fast we could find ourselves in in a dystopia. Sure. I mean, one thing that comes to mind for where we're possibly headed in the future is children of men. We know that sperm yeah. counts and fertility is just flying down a cliff face. And yeah. uh, with every generation that comes next, the, the fertility goes down when it comes to like these phthalate chemicals that are in plastics and in Vaseline injections and, right. and all sorts of other things. Um, these phthalates, they, they cause balls to shrink, sperm to get killed. And, uh, you know, a lot of people with these new Vaseline experiments are, are finding that it attacks the ovaries. You know, the spike protein essentially attacks the ovaries in women with what's happening right now. But, Overall, for the last like, 50 years, sperm counts have been declining. And I think it's entirely possible that uh, there's going to be people having a really hard time making new humans not right. too far into the future. People already have issues with that. You know, Some people have a really hard time having kids or can't oh, yeah. do it. I think that's yeah. going to become more common, and it really makes me wonder, why are the kids of today called Generation Z? What comes after Z? Mm, nothing <laughs> exactly it really makes me wonder why they're called generation z i mean i think well because it was you know x and then y and then z sure but, i wonder what they're gonna call there- the next generation or is it possible and, and you know this is gonna sound crazy to people but is it possible that the kids of today are going to be the last generation of people that are able to have children Mm, that's an interesting concept. You think about the population growth, you know, and you look at it and it's it's hard because I think overall people, if you were to take everybody and put them all on like Australia, I think I read this one statistic. They were like everybody would would have a livable space. That the planet is actually, you know, big enough to support this population uh space-wise, you know, but we all congregate because we all need each other because we're social creatures. But then resource-wise, I guess, is, is the area where it doesn't quite line up. 
the resource thing, though, I, I have big questions about that. I mean, yeah. during the Great Depression, the, the government mandated to the farmers, hey, you need to destroy a bunch of your crops. If you don't destroy your crops, you're not going to get the government subsidy money. So the farmers need to feed their family. So they're going to, of course, take the money and destroy their crops. And this, mm. I, I've heard, I've read that similar things are happening today. These farmers grow more than enough food to feed everybody, but the government is literally mandating that they destroy their own crops. Otherwise, mm. they don't get paid. I, I think that there are enough resources for, the, for everyone that's here. But overpopulation uh, obviously can be the root cause of, of almost all of the world's problems if, if you want it to be that specifically. Right. But, uh, what I'm saying is overpopulation might not be a problem in 30 years. I, I, I'm not sure. You know, with the way people are being sterilized, it's very possible. Well, I mean, that's kind of the thing. It's, it's, it's the whole thing with the whole like kind of overlord. Georgia Guidestones. <laughs> right. You know, just all that stuff. You know, you look at when you look into that stuff and you'd be like, well, I sure do hate traffic. <laughs> you know, like there's that line to ourselves where we're like, we are we good? Are we in homeostasis with this planet? Can we be in homeostasis with this planet? Or, are there, or is there too much of us? And if there's too much of us, what's the humane way? What's the most humane way to get that number down? I think it would probably be less likely to be like, well, let's, if a bunch of people get taken out, that's not very humane. But what if it's just like, ah, you slowly just can't create the numbers. You just can't recreate enough so that way we can get into a thing. It's hard because it's, I don't know, I, I, I guess to the parents that want to have a child that can't conceive one, that that's not very humane to them, that they wouldn't say that's a very humane thing. It's hard to gauge that stuff and to be like, ah, I don't know. Some aspects I'm like, dude, you look at the organizational bureaucracy involved in something like the DMV or, or you know, so much of like our, our road systems and that kind of shit. And you're like, dude, the, pff, really? These people are going to organize some giant population control thing. Like that's kind of <laughs> hard to, that's a big stretch to make that. Like, oh, if you guys can't do this shit, then you can do this. But there's also many, many hands, many arms and, and plausible deniability and, and all these different things is to be like, yeah, it's like it's the captain on the boat ship, right? It's like there's a, ca- uh, a boat steering or a boat, you know, like a big uh, uh, cruise ship. Say it's the Titanic, and it's and it's cruising along, and they're like, "Hey, there's a um, a potential uh, iceberg, and so we're gonna we're gonna avert, or we're gonna do this or that to it." Or the captain says that it's not gonna be a problem for this boat; the hull can take it. We're not gonna veer off course. And then you have all the people on the ship that are like. Well, I, you know, my dad was a, a marine biologist, and I, I mean, so I think we should, you know, and then you get the other, you have this whole ship of people arguing about what they should do. And then, like, the captain who's like, well, I'm the captain. I've spent all my time uh, in my life to become the expert for this particular decision of where to steer the ship. Um, I guess the Titanic is a bad analogy for that because then, <laughs> you know, shit went it bad. Sinks. It sinks, you know, but I get, yeah, that was a horrible analogy then, but same concepts to be like, Hey, what should we, you know, should, should the passengers of the vessel get a vote that has equal weight to the captain of the vessel? I don't know. I mean, I, it's a hard to tell like who's in charge of the ship. Who's in charge of spaceship earth? Well, that's a very debatable topic, but, uh, <laughs> I did want to touch on two things. So with population, when we were kids, I think we were creeping up on 6 billion people. And now we're creeping up on 8 billion people. That is a lot. Yeah, the population has grown like 20-something percent just in our lifetime, which is completely insane. That is nuts. And you were also talking about, you know, government workers, such as people that work at the DMV and shit. Can we really foresee them being responsible for a, a giant worldwide takeover and all this control and power? I, I think right. that the way the power is in this world is so compartmentalized that you don't need everyone in, that works in government or everyone that works in military or everyone that is a CEO in on something. I mean, for fuck's sake, fluoride is in the drinking water of almost every city in this country. It's right. a neurotoxin. It's a fucking neurotoxin. 
and it's in the drinking water for everybody. Then we have shit like Roundup, and they're spraying glyphosate, which causes cancer. They're spraying that on all the food. Uh, now Bill Gates is the biggest agriculture farmland owner in America. It's really crazy. So I understand that a big takeover and all this power being held by government bureaucrats sounds unlikely, and I agree. That doesn't sound likely at all to me either. But then you have to sit back and scratch your head and wonder like, okay, well, why the fuck is there neurotoxic chemicals in the water? Why are they spraying cancer-causing pesticides all over our food? You know? I always come back to that quote that it seems to fit for everything and almost any answer I needed, it makes the most sense. Uh, it's the most fitting proposition, which is... Uh, what is the answer to 99 out of 100 questions? Money. Mm -hmm. If you really want to find out why anything happens ever, anywhere, why? Money. Somebody makes more money with it being the way that it is than not. That's pretty much it. And that's not an anti-capitalist standpoint. It's just fact. It's just human beings are just going to be driven by their necessity for resources to acquire because that's how we continue to survive and live, right? So apply that to bigger scales and you start to see people being, you know, an insurance company, remember in Fight Club, Edward Norton, he's an adjuster or whatever for the insurance company and he goes out and, and they say that if the cost of the recall is more than the potential claims that they have to pay out on said accidents happening, mm -hmm. then they you don't let do the accidents one. happen. Yeah. Then they don't do one. Of course, yeah. There's, there's so many Money. things in the world that are, Good for humanity, bad for business. Right. Bad for the, the bank account, but really good for humanity, such as renewable energy. Like, why are we not harvesting the kinetic energy of the ocean? It's the most powerful thing on the planet that's never going to stop moving. And we don't utilize that for energy. Well, there's a, something called the energy return on energy investment. Sure. And that's e essentially, the we have never found anything that produces anywhere close to what we get from fossil fuels. Now, is that because we have, you know, of, of Westinghouse and, you know, JP Morgan and them shutting down Tesla's ideas and could Tesla's ideas have evolved into the technology being advanced enough to get an ERO, EI on the kinetic energy from the oceans or geothermal energy or even solar energy. Well, the Tesla thing was just straight up coming out of the electricity in the air. You know, right. the, the now, air we're breathing right now is electric. He figured out right. how to tap into that. Right. Now they, they say that Tesla's ideas are kind of like they're here. The, his, his stuff was wireless stuff. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi, 5g, 4g, if, if, if you're not into the 5g, <laughs> but, um, but that those ideas were extrapolated as much as they could be and that the potential for like massive wireless power transfer is not really doable. Um, but I, I think that's the thing is to be like, well, that's based off of what we think could happen with 100 years of Tesla's ideas being funded. But, yeah. maybe, but you know, we don't know about human ingenuity and discoveries can come kind of out of left field. It may be that if that, technology wasn't suppressed, you know, in order to push, you know, the, the direct current and sell copper and all that stuff, um, that maybe it's possible that it, it maybe not directly the stuff that he was trying, but that the opening up that field of inquiry and research might, they might've discovered something completely different better. that yeah, would have better. solved the thing. But that leads us to the unidentified aerial phenomena topic for me because I, I keep, I, you know, I keep getting into this energy thing, right? Because it's, it's our biggest problem on the planet really. And we have, you know, direct confirmation that there are vehicles that are able to travel at Mach 20 with no visible propulsion trail, uh, no sound, things that are violating our laws of physics that are a, th a thousand years more advanced than our technology. So if that technology exists, what does that mean for keeping the lights on? You know what I mean? If you can travel light years, the energy required to do that, why are we talking about even using solar energy or, or kinetic energy from the ocean when clearly there's technology out there that's 
far supersedes any demands that we could have to power ourselves on Earth. Was it Element 151? Is that it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I watched that Bob Lazar documentary. And, um, you know, there's a lot of scientists over the last hundred years that were working on anti-gravity propulsion. It's, yeah. it's not just alien stuff. There's a lot of scientists that worked on amazing technological advancements that have been suppressed. There's tons right. of them. I mean, water-powered cars, anti-gravity machines. There's all kinds of devices that have been suppressed because, again, it's good for humanity, bad for business. And the people that... <laughs> I think those people are just not creative enough in, in learning how to market it then. You know, be like there's a sure. way to integrate there's you, a way to integrate it. You could say the same about JP Morgan when Tesla was around. He he could have figured out a way and yeah. to, to put up Tesla coils everywhere, but you had to buy them through JP Morgan or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Or or, or figure out a subsidy deal. You know what I mean? Where be like, hey man, you'll get rich. You'll be you'll be cool. You'll get you'll get handled for it. And the, but this is gonna make stuff that much better for everybody. But maybe when you're in that club you kind of like it to be exclusive. Yeah, I think so. I think when people get to a certain point where they have all the money in the world, more money than they could spend in a hundred lifetimes. I don't think at that point it's about the money anymore. I think they get off on the power. I think mm. controlling people becomes the aphrodisiac and that's where they get off. That's that's a, there's a, obviously a strong possibility with that. We see it um, in any kind of a position. Anytime somebody gets a little bit of power, a little bit of control, the propensity for it to go to their head um, is extremely high, you know? And that's why it's like... Especially when you're the, like a multi-billionaire and you, yeah. you're a Jeff Bezos or yeah, you know, like I mean, a, a Rockefeller or J.P. Morgan or the Warburgs. Yeah, I mean, look at the uh, this, this. Look at the even like the uh, and it's it's inherent. It's it's just built in. Look at the Stanford uh, Stanford prison experiment. Yep, it was it was fake power. It wasn't even real. This is pretend. It's make believe. But they were willing. They were fucking willing to hurt each other in order to do it. And the and so if you look at that and you're like, that is just then shows you it's a mirror. It's a reflection of inherent human traits that we have, and the absolute naivete to believe that your particular political affiliation, your in-groups, that they are impervious to these inherent human traits. It's ridiculous. You know, these are human things. They're not things that are like, oh, well, I'm on the right side of this or that. It's like, put your person in power and watch it corrupt them. It's a universal yeah. law. Make a, make a thousand horsepower engine. Guess so what is happens? The an is the answer to have nobody in power? Uh, you know, some of those anarchist ideas are kind of interesting that, that, because there is natural law um, and natural law does sort of tend to resolve things one I, way or the other. I agree. But you look at that and you're like, look what happens when toilet paper runs low. Sure. That's not even a necessity. That's a luxury. So yeah. what happens when the real necessities get low? You know, you see people turn animalistic. Yeah, it'll like be in like a that blink, movie, in a the blink road. of an eye, in a blink of an eye, dude. You know, but so then you're like, okay, well, but is that should you just let the chips fall where they may, and and you know, and then we fall back to straight up kind of Darwinian evolutionary traits where you know it's the thrival of the fittingest. Whoever's yep. gonna survive is gonna survive, and and if you're weak, then you're gonna be bred out. But then that's that's like eugenics. Yeah, that's eugenics, and it's also it's neglecting the other side of our inherent human trait of caring for each other. That when you see people during a natural national uh, 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 natural disasters go out of their way and risk their own lives to save a stranger, we have that in us too, all of us. Yeah. You know that line. The line that runs between good and evil is in the middle of every human heart. Absolutely. I, I've said this for a long time. I think that everybody has it in them to be like Gandhi or be like Hitler. Literally, yep. every Hitler. one of us has the potential to be benevolent or to be a completely malicious psychopath. Yep. 
uh, it's interesting that uh, Jordan Peterson talks about that stuff where he's like, part of the reason why he people are always asking him, I was reading one of his, or watching an interview where people are always like, why do you have pictures of Stalin and, and Mao and, and, and these, these monsters in your home? And he's like, I think it's important to remind ourselves that unless you take account of your own propensity to potentially become a monster, unless you acknowledge the shadow, if you look at Jungian psychology, you know, if you don't acknowledge the shadow, then it, then those tendencies are going to make their way out, but in a way that's not under your control. So if you have, if we take, take full uh, inventory of our capability as human beings, you have to include the propensity for yourself to do evil and to, and to be a bad person. Yeah. And that, that way, you know, you know, Hey, I, I've got that potential. So I need to be the steerer. Uh, I need to be the rider of the elephant and, 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 and be able to get it to go where I want it to go. Because sometimes if you don't, you know, that, that elephant's much stronger than you, that 95% uh, of our behavior is subconscious, subconscious programs. And if you don't acknowledge the fact that we all have that capability, it's like, we're the person that like the person in front of us, we honk at, you know, we're also the person that there's a dog crossing in front of our vehicle. And so we slam on the brakes and then get honked at from the person behind. The person mm-hmm. behind doesn't realize the reason that I was slamming on my brakes is there was a dog crossing the street and I didn't want to hit it. So we are both of those people, you know, and, and we're just, we're so fast to, to be like, God, fuck this fucking idiot. You know what I mean? Like to it, the traffic is a perfect example, you know, in those type of situations. But so I think that um, that's like one of the things that we have to kind of recognize is that, do we want the chips to fall where they may just let everything happen and uh, this, you know, survival of the fittest, but we also care about each other and we want, and we do have that internal drive unless we're, you know, sociopaths or psychopaths and that, that we want to help people when there's a natural, you know, when somebody's hurting, when somebody needs help, we want to do that. We want to help that person, but we also have the desire, you know, we also have the capability of being like, Hey, when gas runs out and it's the apocalypse, like, and it's me or you, it's me. Yeah. It's all about the potential and the potential for people to be evil is really there. And the p- potential for people to be great, uh, kind, good people is also there. And you were talking about driving the elephant and, you know, being aware that you have the potential to go either way. So you need to be in control of which, which way you're steering Right. One thing about some of that nanotech that we were talking about earlier, where it can be integrated into the brain and to make people essentially remote control, is what if some of that self determination goes out the window and then you literally are just an, a biological robot, an automaton mm-hmm. that's on, uh, acting on behalf of somebody else's programming? And even before talking about the idea of remote control, which has been around for Decades. In the 1960s, there was a guy that was remote controlling a fucking bull with, with literally a remote. And he was talking about how, uh, you know, just around the corner, we don't even need to have the, the remote. We can just do it wirelessly without an implant being in the brain. So this technology has been around for a long time. But I can't help but think that some people are being driven like automatons today because they're being programmed not by some sort of computer chip in their brain with some nerd at a computer, but literally people's mentality, people's mindset, the way that they view the world and the thoughts that they have are largely being manipulated by an outside entity. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so that social dilemma, I think, did a pretty good job of of demonstrating that, that, yeah. you know, that there's a... A desire to do it, but now and that was for you know all for monetary reasons too. It was all it was all about ads and turning your your um, your data into sales. Um, well, in, in regards to that movie, yes, but I think the social engineers are really trying to push for literally society to change. That's that's what social engineering is. It's not just about making money, but I think it's about creating this structure that we are all going to be living in. That that was engineered. That's completely unnatural. That that benefits a few instead of the many. I, I think that's right. happening right in front of our very eyes right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean that, that that if you look at this the 
the failed states um, that have existed throughout the, the last hundred years, even. And you see that there's always going to be a protected class. There'll always be that five five percent, you know, that's like going to be living large, um, no matter what. And so uh, some of the some of the things are like if you know that you have limited resources, say we know that like, you know, separate out the, the extraterrestrial uh, potential and that, and that energy potential, um, separate that stuff out. Right. And then think about just solving the energy return on energy investment equation. Right. And if we can't solve it, anything past petroleum is the best that we've got and we've got a limited amount of it. And so if that's the case and you're in the club, you want those reserves for you in your in your club. So how do you how do you implement that? Be like, uh, we could have a, a small amount of people live very very lovely lives for a very long time. Then how did they not do that? I think that's you know, do you not let that internal barometer of you know, I want to see people succeed. I want to take care of people. If somebody's hurting, I want to help. But if it's your family versus my family, then I'm choosing my family. And I think that that's, that's a, that's a hard line to see play out when you're at the helm, when we're not at the helm, we're like, well, (laughs) strength is in numbers and the people are going to want to get to the helm and figure out how to steer the ship. I don't know. But that's why I, that's why like, I can't throw that technology that, that is real is confirmed real now that UAP, there's no doubt in anybody's mind, unless they're, it's, you know, fucking holograms. Or something, you know, what I mean? like Spider Man, uh, Far From Home, you know, Mysterio technology. For for the most part, every 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 country has admitted that that you know Russia and 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 America, New Zealand, Australia, everybody's admitted that that technology is real, that that phenomenon is real. There is stuff that goes Mach twenty, and we don't know what powers it. We don't know it's not ours. Uh, we can't confirm that it's extraterrestrial. We can't confirm that it's that it's from another solar system or from another galaxy, but we can't not confirm that. But the tech is real. Those things are real. So if that stuff's real, what the hell are we doing arguing about any of this shit for? Like, why, why do we not have access to that technology? Is it, are there, you know, the beings inside of them, are they, not, are they willing to communicate with us? Are they not willing to communicate with us? Are they the ones that seeded us and they're just monitoring their ant farm? Like, like I what said, the hell is going on? I, I, but that's the biggest question, and nobody <clears throat> gives a shit either. That's the craziest part to me. I think nobody the gives people, a shit about any of that. I think the people that are in control want to maintain that control, and <laughs> you lose a lot of control if everybody has uh, spaceships and free energy, you know, and, and and understands like that this universe that we're living in is even more spectacular than we can already witness. Yeah, and this is just one universe. Yeah, you know, the uh, UFO thing, I can't help but think of Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump mm, yeah, going, you going to Seems Antarctica. Interesting stuff. He claims that there, he saw fresh water and jungles down there and uh, their whole fleet, military fleet, about half of it was lost. They said it was from flying objects that are similar to what you're describing and a lot of people would call flying saucers. And uh, uh, apparently, during Operation High Jump, the mission was to search and destroy a Nazi base on Antarctica. And I I don't necessarily (laughs) believe this. I don't necessarily think it's completely unthinkable. I'm I'm on the fence. I'm just aware of of the theory that there was a Nazi base on Antarctica, and they had access to anti-gravity technology. And they were in, in cahoots with extraterrestrials and building uh, spaceships, essentially. Man, that's, uh, you know, I, I read into that stuff and it was, you know, some of the stuff that's like, okay, well, there was an expedition sent down there. Like, that's real. They did send, you know, four destroyers and like 4,000 troops, but it was for an expedition, mm-hmm. like an exploratory expedition is mm-hmm. what the the official report is or whatever. Um I don't know why you send 4,000 troops down to Antarctica and four destroyers plus the other ships for an exploratory expedition. 
I think that doesn't fit in with, you know, I think you'd send a team full of scientists and maybe a few, you know, soldiers or whatever in case you encounter armed penguins or something. But um, <laughs> it's weird, you know, and, 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 and then even that with that Russian, you know, documentary that you sent that was finally translated and, and, and them going into the whole concept that they had found a bunch of Hitler's um, documents and that he was, you know, obviously it was, it's well known. He was highly interested in the occult yep. um, and highly interested in, in uh, experiments on humans and, and all this crazy, crazy stuff. And that uh, apparently it found blueprints in there for, for some of those devices. Like, but I saw the other thing too, that was like, Oh, what are the potential for, extraterrestrials to be down with Hitler's cause, you know, like, and that that's, that they weren't, and that that was part of the reason why there was the, a fall or whatever is because they were like, you can't use this technology for, uh, for what you're doing. But the interesting part is this, because all that stuff is so fantastical that it's just like, okay, dude, yeah, right, right, right. Might as well be fucking Nazi base on the moon. And then we got to, you know, <laughs> that fucking, uh, what was that? What was that movie? Iron Sky. Ugh. It, yeah, it, it, it is really fascinating, though, that Antarctica stuff. is off limits. You're not allowed to go there as a civilian, and you can't well, fly safety, over though. Antarctica. That's just for your safety. Oh, right. Yeah. They just don't want you getting lost. Just like wearing a mask on an airplane, but I can take it off to eat some pretzels and drink some water, and everybody else can at the same time for my safety. Well, if you, but you have to pull it back up, though. Oh, In yeah, I forgot. Bites. I got to pull it back up after eating the pretzels and drinking with everybody well, else at the same time. Well, because but here's the thing. Science. Well, here's the thing. So the interesting thing I was going to say about the, about the, the whole fantasticalness of the, mm-hmm. the sort of the absurdity of, you know, you know, Hitler having a base on Antarctica or in Antarctica or under it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that, and that, you know, that they went down there, there were these flying saucers and stuff. Well, they we do know that he was spending a lot of money and sending a lot of resources down to Antar- uh, Antarctica yep. at a time when it was not in any of the German military's interest to be wasting any money. I Correct. mean, they were they were on the ropes and getting their asses kicked, and then you're going to spend a bunch of money at fucking sending subs down to Antarctica? Like, what the fuck are you doing? I mean, also, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with the fact that the guy was crazy, sociopath, uh, nightmare of a person. But mm-hmm. um, the fact is this, that those reports of the unidentified aerial phenomenon go back 70 years. There it is, ladies and germs, part one of two parts. Make sure you guys tune in for the next episode so you can hear the end of this conversation. Like I said, it was very dense with information. And I felt like it was a good idea to break it up into two parts. So I'm supposed to be doing a new interview tomorrow with a very special guest. And uh, time will tell if it works out. If it does, I'm going to have an amazing interview for you guys on episode 47. So please look forward to that. And feel free to shoot me an email, podcast at riftsordie.com. Go to patreon.com slash riftsordie. Subscribe if you want to take part in the Zoom Hangouts. And you can go to riffsordie.com to pick up some merch. Take care of yourselves and each other, everyone. I will talk to you again next week for part two of this interview. Cheerio. Cheerio.